Hello, Internet, and welcome back to Makers on Tap, the podcast where makerspace directors drink and talk about making stuff and maker culture. I'm your host, Aaron, and joining me tonight are... Joe. And Chris. All right. I am super excited about tonight's episode because we've all had several drinks already. <laughs> it's going to be interesting. <laughs> going to be great. Yeah, it's <laughs> one hour later than we typically record, and we started trying to record at the normal time, so... <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so to start off, what are you guys drinking tonight, mm. Joe? Zombie dust. Nice. Very much going with the new layer of spotted cow because that was immediately what was available and didn't smash on me when I was riding my one wheel back. <laughs> what did smash on you on your way back on your one wheel? I mean, the usual. The like, I mean, my tried and true uh, z- or zombie killer or yeah, zombie killer. Um, I had some of that and, uh, got into an accident on the one wheel It's totally fine. I just scraped myself up pretty good. Chris got a one wheel guys. Yeah. I'm only a little jealous. <laughs> only a little, a <laughs> little bit. I got to ride it though. It was super fun. And then I immediately thought I broke it. <laughs> <laughs> I got to bring it to the space so people can ride it and, totally trash that like they trash my vive headset when i first got that as well <sighs> yeah i just remembered that as i was saying that what are you drinking aaron <laughs> i am on my second yingling and i have a third on the way you know at least you haven't drank like a giant glass of kirkland vodka and coke like you used to do <laughs> I had that at seven. Oh, good. did you so really? It was a while. It was so, a while ago. <laughs> that, are you are you actually three drinks in then? <laughs> uh, oh. I had a big glass of water in between, so I'm pretty sure I'm good. Oh, there oh, re-record Aaron might be on the episode. Okay, I'm feeling it. I'm feeling it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even buzzed. Sure, that's what you've said every time. <laughs> And oh, news man. topics. This episode's going to get out of hand. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Joe, do you want to talk about the 3D printed speaker? Yeah, this is the coolest thing I've seen on Hackaday in a long time. And that's because I like speakers, uh, not because I don't read Hackaday often. So this dude, uh, Paul Ellis, he has been doing 3D printed speaker drivers. So not the speaker enclosure. Everybody prints speaker enclosures. And they're super cool. So, you know, not to downplay that. But this is exceptionally interesting to me because he's actually making the speaker driver. So the thing that when everyone says, I may, I have a speaker in my hand, that's what they're talking about. It's mm-hmm. the metal cage with the movie cone and the rubbery thing and the little thing in the middle. That's the speaker driver. He is 3D printing every section of that except for the magnet and, like, the voice coil. So the surround, the spider, the cone, all of these things have to do with the physics of the speaker that make the sound. And he's making some incredible stuff. And if you don't know a lot about speakers, I'm not going to dive into the science behind them. But there is one thing that's really, really amazing. And that's the efficiency of the speaker, which is rated with a decibel meter uh, putting one watt into the speaker measured one foot away and it is a very very good hi-fi speaker like the highest end uh right now is like 95 like 92 to 97 db efficiency so it makes 92 to 97 decibels pumping one watt at one foot i think one foot or one inch. Yeah, Can't that remember. sounds about right. I'm drunk. These are doing 80 dB, which is phenomenally efficient for crappy speakers. And these are speakers that are 3D printed, and they sound phenomenal. Like, really, really good. There's there's not a whole lot of articles that I would be like, that you need to pause the episode right now and actually go look at this article, because, like, please... Uh, give this man credit because it's freaking awesome. Cause at first I thought this was the guy that we talked to at Murph who was doing the enclosures when you sent this article. And I was like, Oh, that's fucking cool. Like he's done some more stuff. Then oh, no. I saw that's what orthographic audio, by the way, he's yes. real cool. 
He's a cool guy. Um, <clears throat> then I saw what this actually was, and holy crap, this like changes a lot of things yeah. because like the fact that it's getting eighty to ninety. Because like you can see in the video, he gets close to ninety at some points, and he might be pumping a little bit more wattage in there. I wouldn't be surprised if he's pumping three to five. Yeah, but like it sounds great. Like yeah. it's it's insanity that this is like. Because he's got he's got the whole cone, he's got the spider, and then he's got a three D printed enclosure around it. It's basically a three D printed speaker except for the frequency driver, and that's it. Like yeah. the the coil and the voice or the voice coil and the magnet, that's it. And it's like you can just pick those up for nothing. And if you could just like pick that up and then put it on anything, like that is freaking incredible. Like I can't wait to start messing around with this when I get my new printer. Like. <laughs> So he doesn't have links to any of the files yet, but there are there is a link in the article to the thread where he's discussing his research and how he's pushing the speaker parameters. If you're an audio audiophile or a speaker nerd, you'll love the discussion that's going on in the thread. I don't I, I haven't dove this deep into a news article in a long time. I'm really excited about it. So the second one is a little less exciting, but there's an there's an uh, article on Hackaday on the ESP8266 and the ESP32 Wi-Fi libraries getting hacked. So there were three vulnerabilities found, one of which were, was just for the ESP8266 when it would try to connect to an access point. There's a potential you could send some malicious packets and overflow it when it's trying to connect. Not a huge deal. It's already been patched. The second and third ones were mostly just for... Um, the extensible authentication protocol, which is mostly used in enterprise and high security environments. Again, that might not apply to a lot of our listenerships, but it's just something to keep in mind. Two of the three have already been patched by Espressif. So if you're using any of those in a high security environment where that might be applicable, just throw it back in your IDE and just reflash your same code and it'll just flash the updated libraries. The funny part in this was, uh, the author pointed out that the irony is that if you're using WPA2 for your, you know, your Wi-Fi authentication, you're actually safer than if you are unpatched. <laughs> Jeez. Which is not something you hear every day. Well, thank you to all of our white hats and gray hats out there keeping us safe. That's right. And with that, we've got a brand new segment tonight. Woo! It is called the Hold My Beer. And Joe, what 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 is the what is the uh what what are we showcasing? Well, <laughs> this is a tool changing 3D printer by a guy named Rob Mink. It's based on the uh, Piper Two Plus, I think. And this thing's like insane. It. it really deserves the inaugural episode of this. So when you when you click on the YouTube video, you'll notice a few things. First thing you'll notice is holy crap! That's a whole lot of tool heads. <laughs> 13 yep. tool heads on this machine and you know what he's using to drive 13 tool heads is it some crazy advanced board is it some out of this world custom developed contr no no it's like five ramps boards running off a of clipper <laughs> with a giant love rat's it. nest behind the printer it is so amazing <laughs> I just want it he's going to be at Earth. I'm so excited to meet him and see this thing printing. I it's, hope he doesn't even clean up the wires. <laughs> that's what I was going to say. I hope it stays the same. I hope it stays the, the, the this rat nest in the back of it because that's so authentic. It's yes. so real. <laughs> yes. And then, uh, Aaron, what's the other printer that he's got? Oh, yeah. So he actually made a custom polar printer, which is, you know, you have one axis that goes, you know, back and forth. It's the Y that goes back and forth, and then the X rotates in place. Yeah, so it's um, like a turntable. Yeah, so he mentions in the video that he made that printer from scratch, not knowing that there's already polar printers out there. But the cool thing is that part of the build surface doesn't exist on the on the turntable. Mm. So it just, you the part will literally just rotate off of the build surface. Yeah. And so he has an auto dislodger. For the prints. Yeah, it's like a it, it's like his print surface is this like floppy plastic that just has like painters tape on it. And then he's got skate bearings on a sheet of plywood to like hold it down to a build surface. And then 
halfway through the rotation, it just drops off into nowhere and turns it back into floppy plastic, so the parts just fall off. Interesting. <laughs> it's really dope. It, huh. It's, it's genius in the best way. I, I <laughs> yeah. love seeing things like this. Good job, Rob. You get the Hold My Beer Award this week. The first inaugural one. I don't know what you win. Maybe a good crisp high five if you come to the Makers on Tap booth. The crispest high five. Uh, you win the internet. That's what you win. <laughs> I give some solid ass high fives. Let, let me just say. Project update. <laughs> Project updates. Project updates. I'm going to go the first because like, I have the shortest and quickest of it. Um, but I will give a shout out. Um, I'm going to look up and make sure I'm doing this correctly. Um, so my project update is that I haven't made a whole lot of pro or progress too much on too many things, but, um, aside from buying the files for my R2, um, that I'm going to be doing, uh, and getting some of the stuff ready for the, uh, the cosplay builders meetup. Um, I finally bought my new 3d printer. Um, and I want to give a shout out to the guys over at tinymachines3d.com. Uh, I'm going to be getting a Formbot T-Rex 3700. Um, and boy, am I excited for this 3D printer. Um, it's an IDEX-based 3D printer with two, two, two tool heads um, functioning in IDEX that will be really freaking fun to finally mess with. So I'm planning on doing a whole lot of prints with this thing uh, and the ability to be able to do multicolored prints and all that kind of stuff is going to be able or going to be really fun for that. Um, I will shout out to Chris over at tiny machines. Uh, he's been working with me through the whole process of getting this whole thing ordered uh, and having it ready. And so free shout out to you, good dude. Like you've been helping me through this and it's been awesome. So wanted to give you a little bit of, a little bit of credit where credit is due. Yay. I'm excited for it. I can't wait to get it because I have been working on a design for an IDEX 3D printer. And so I have those BCN Sigmas, which have been um, hit and miss as I've yeah. been playing with them. So I'm excited to see the T-Rex and I'm excited to see the um, print profiles that they sent you for Simplify, too. I think you yeah. sent those to me and I need to. I print. sent you the Simplify ones. I haven't sent you the Cura ones. Like they link the cure ones Ooh, to me and I, I have to look at those. that um, because they basically were like, Hey, you have to wipe the cure li library in order to like put our profiles on there. And I was like, totally cool with that. Let's do it. And so I haven't done it yet, but he, he linked everything to me. And so we're getting ready to kind of like look at that because hopefully um, printer should be shipping on Monday. And so there, he was basically saying you should be receiving it next week. So I'm hoping to have it on Thursday and then do a build night because everything that I've read says it should be be or it should be able to be built within three hours. So if I bring it on Thursday, we might be able to actually have a print running on Thursday night. Nice. I would so that. I'm excited. Yeah, I, I'll go next. I made an axe. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Hell yeah, I, you did. <laughs> I finally made a project that was just for me. It wasn't for a product. It wasn't for like somebody else. It wasn't for something that I was going to sell. I made a project for me and I'm super stoked about it. I took a Ace Hardware half hatchet. So like, it's got a hammer head on the back and a nice hatchet face on the front. And I kind of fell in love with those for axe throwing. It's kind of my new obsession right now. And um, I spent an absurd amount of time sanding and polishing that head to a mirror. And then I bearded it, which means you like cut out the bottom of the, the axe head. So it looks like it's got a big beard hanging from it. It looks like a Viking thing and it's badass. <laughs> yeah. And I contoured the top to make it all spiky looking. And then I actually designed and I 3D printed a axe handle to the print was just a placeholder to make sure I liked the way it felt in my hand. And I, my plan was to 3D machine the handle on. Uh, I ran out of time before the axe competition that I wanted to have it ready for. So I cleaned up and reshaped an existing axe handle that I just bought as a backup because I knew I, I knew I had a time limit. And I'm honestly, I'm really happy with that axe handle after I reshaped it on the belt sander and then I laser etched my logos into it. We'll post pictures. It's real cool. Yeah. 
I did end up getting knocked out of the axe throwing tournament in the second round by a guy who just turned out to be phenomenal. Um, we were like neck and neck, but I'm really, really happy with how that axe turned out and how it throws. So it didn't help me that the first time I threw it was at the tournament that night. That, <laughs> that didn't help me at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it definitely but. was like it was a learning experience with that thing. But you you stuck it a good amount of times. Oh, yeah. Like, by the end of the night, I was doing great with it. Had I had at two hours to throw it ahead of time, but, you know, I did me, and I oiled the handle the night before, and the oil was still tacky when I left for work that morning, and just like, yeah. well. <laughs> <laughs> That's my project update. So, for my updates, the stuff that I've been working on this past week has been more for the makerspace than for myself. Um, I did wrap up the new makerspace website which was written in hugo um i did put the finishing touches on that and i announced it today in slack saying hey i think i'm done for this current thing you know what do you guys think i'd like to get this switched over if we all agree on it so mm -hmm. waiting for feedback on that i put a lot of effort this week into the new wiki as well which is beautiful Oh, it's so nice. I love it. Put a lot of effort into different guides and articles for that. Part of which is I've been revisiting our 3D printing process at the Makerspace. And I've been trying to think through how we're doing that and how it can be improved. Um, for one, we have two Lulzbot Tazes on a, a like a pallet rack. Yeah. And they weren't really named. So we're like, oh, the left one and the right one. Well, they're both slightly different because one has an arrow shooter. So, like, if anybody for who knows why, but if they were ever swapped, then that na though that naming wouldn't work anymore as far as yeah. printing profiles. So, I, I kind of made a little decision. I threw it out there. I'm like, hey, can we just like name these printers based on who donated them or like who technically who they're owned by? Because we technically don't own any of these printers so far. Right. So now these are named, you know, by the people who own them. And I also added all of the printing profiles to the wiki. We use Cura Lulzbot Edition yeah. um, for slicing. So I went through the printer profile setup for each printer, and I took screenshots of all the windows and, like, green boxes saying, add these values, you know, to set the printer up. So now it's all good for each printer. And I worked on setting up a dedicated laptop that will have Cura Lulzbot Edition with all the profiles already set up. And... Uh, have bookmarks in Firefox for all of our Octoprint servers. So you can just, you know, slice your thing, click on the right Octoprint server, and then throw your G code up. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm working on this week. I have that mostly done. The, the laptop is fully configured, um, passwordless, like setup, and you just g jump on the computer, slice your thing, and go. The only issue is that that sp specific laptop has a bad touchpad, it's impossible to use. So we have like 10 or 13 other identical laptops at this space. So this week I'm going to go through and find one that works and just swap the SSD into that. That's all I should have to do so far. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. You know, that kind of leads me into our main topic, which is duocracy. Yep. Lots of makerspaces have this as a way of dealing with work and authority at the space. So the term duocracy means the person doing the work has the most say in how it is done because he is doing it or she is doing it. They are doing it. They are doing it. Thank you. There you go. And usually that's fine, but sometimes it can be rough. Joe, you've been, you're a founding member of the space. Would you be able to give us some background on how it's worked at RCL in the past? Well, I mean, especially early on, a lot of it was um, something needed to get done. We just did it. There, there was no discussion. There was no waiting for somebody's approval. Um, I knew I was capable or the individual knew they were capable. And these did what needed to be done. And that worked for probably three years. And until the space started to grow to the point where everybody didn't know everybody. Mm -hmm. And like so things would show up at the space and you'd just be like, what is this? Whose crap is this? Does this work? What what is going on with this? So like then it became a point where you couldn't just do whatever you wanted and whatever that needed to be done because you may be screwing up somebody else's things. 
um, or somebody else may be in the middle of doing that thing. So there was a little bit, there needed to start be a little bit of a discussion. And then it started to turn into kind of a bureaucracy instead of a duocracy. That ruined everything. I would like to go back to a makerspace with 15 people. (laughs) (laughs) RTL version 2, baby. And selected. No, but, you know, I think the where really, where duocracy really starts to fall apart is when the people that are very knowledgeable and therefore very powerful in the space are to the point where they're burnt out and they don't want to deal with it anymore. And new people are stepping up and they're excited and they want to do the things, but they can't do the things as well as the people who used to do the things. So then the people that used to do the things get annoyed and they're like, well, I could just do that. And then they never do. That's me. That's me. Just to work clear. (laughs) <laughs> you know i'm i'm owning it um they're like well i could just do it better you know and the new people really want to try and then the old people are annoyed that's where everything starts to fall apart well and i think there's there's that version and then there's probably what we're gonna get into very quickly where is somebody will say something and be like i'm gonna do it this way And then there's a bunch of bench engineers who go, hey, that's not the way you should be doing it. And even though they're not doing anything, they're telling the person who is actually doing something that they shouldn't be doing it that way. And yeah. (laughs) That's a great segue, Chris. Thank you. (laughs) So I'm just leading you into it, man. I'm getting you ready. I'm priming you. (laughs) Thank you. We may have did this to Aaron this week. (laughs) <laughs> which is fine not really on purpose i was trying to start a discussion and... which there should be a discussion like <laughs> i was trying to start a discussion so, uh, give the example let's go into okay it. so here's here's the situation i talked about how i'm revisiting how we print things on the printers at the space up until now and we still are using cure little bot edition i threw it out there saying hey i know by the end of the year we are losing at least one of the little bots as one of the members is taking it back. That'll take us down to one little bot TAS6 and one custom printer. And then probably we'd be bringing back another printer bot simple into the mix. So we only use the little bot cure because we had mostly little bots and then we can just utilize the the material profiles, you know, minimize support costs. If we're down to just one little bot and multiple other custom ones, you know, do we need to stick with it? And that's just the question I posed. And since I'm revisiting the whole thing, I, I, I have the laptop set up. I was going to set up, you know, Cure Little's Bot Edition like we have currently. But apparently, the latest version of Cure Little's Bot Edition from Little's Bot does not install properly on Ubuntu 18.04 LTS. It appears they compiled it for 19.10. This is weird. Okay. It's it's easily it's it's clearly a mistake. Yeah, I would expect them to fix that soon. But well, here's the thing: there is a ticket in their internal system dated in May. Yeah. Oh, seriously. That this did not work. Yes. Oh shoot. Okay. And and that was several versions of their software ago that it did not install in Linux correctly. Yeah. Because it had a dependency of a version that was did not exist in the current repos for Ubuntu. It was like the bleeding edge version of Ubuntu could only install it. Yeah, which is okay. weird because they run off of Debian, which is like yeah, because they're old fully Ubuntu. open source. Like they're, that whole company is open source, so like huh. I don't know anything about their workflow. Yeah, it's, it, but it has to be something about their build process because if you build it from source, it works just fine. So it's it's literally comes down to how you're compiling the dev package. So. Uh, whatever. It, it didn't install correctly, you know, by itself. So I'm like, well, I don't want to build from source if because that's a pain. So I'm like, are we sure we want to keep using this? And I threw that out in our Slack group saying, hey, do we want to try anything else? Do you want to try, you know, Cure Ultimaker Edition? Do you want to try Prusa Slicer, Standard Slicer, whatever? And then it became a whole... No, you're missing Somehow. one part of that that made it ins- I'm 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 dancing around it, Chris. Yeah, you're dancing fucking around it. <laughs> Tap Your point dancing. was do you want to it we want to install a new piece of software on the computers that runs with Linux. 
And that well, was the uh, whole fucking thing. Okay. No, no, that's not the whole thing. The whole thing is that Lulzbot Cure Edition, that version of Lulzbot Cure Edition, installs fine on Windows. Yeah. Doesn't install fine on Linux. Aaron was wiping the laptops. So we said, so I brought up with some snark, but you know, it's me and Aaron. Why not just run Windows? <laughs> right, right. And then Aaron just disappeared. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was joking, but I wasn't. But to Aaron's point, Aaron, finish your point. So my point is that I'm doing the work. I am here and willing and able to do the work. I'm doing it the best way that I know how. Granted, I know how to do both ways. I know how to do Windows as well. But I feel, I personally feel that Linux is the way to go for this because for the workflow of slicing the models and uploading it to Octoprint is OS agnostic. There's nothing about that workflow that requires knowledge of Linux or Windows. You click on the icon to open Cura, you slice, you slice your model, you open up Firefox, which has the exact same icon as it does in Windows, and then, then Firefox looks the same, whether it's in Windows or Linux. You click the bookmark to get to your Octoprint server, and you, you slap that G-code in there. That's like all if it runs all according to plan, though. Like, if you don't have to do any troubleshoot, like, that is that is literally the best case scenario. If you have to run any type of troubleshooting, though, you're having to deal with people who don't know the environment. Well, the one thing I will give Aaron in this context is those laptops suck. So Yeah, they are garbage. <laughs> yeah. Running Windows on them is a pretty terrible experience. And I'm, they run, I'm not arguing that. I'm, they, I'm not arguing that <laughs> in the slightest. They run Linux real fast mm -hmm. so i will i will give and they run point. current versions of linux which is kind of nice yeah um, maybe maybe this is a moot point <laughs> I, I mean <laughs> it's 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 basically because this so this discussion has come up multiple times um this discussion has come up multiple times in different parts of the space is should we be running linux versus windows i always believe the user should never have trouble using any of the stuff in the space, and they should be comfortable with whatever they're doing. And that's why I argue so hard for Windows, is because Windows is the world's largest operating system. It's what everybody uses. But no, as as much as like we are in, like are trying to push open source and everything, and like I have Linux on my home computer, I have Linux on my laptop, like I dual boot everything, but like we always need to be thinking about the end user part of what, what's going to be easiest for them to use. I agree. And that's why I decided on Linux. <laughs> <laughs> but here's the thing. Like it just, it just works. Well, here's the thing. The current desktop PC has been in, in service for like at least a year now that runs the laser cutters have had a single issue back on that. And people use the crap out of that computer. Yep. I had another laptop set up for this stuff for the printer and it, it always worked for me whenever I just turned I would use it like, you know, every four months and I would just open it up and it would work. It works for you and it works right now. But like I'm thinking of a background for where I work with electronics for my job that are in service for 17 plus years. And when I think about this, I'm thinking about that where you're not going to be around anymore. You're going to be doing something else and you're not going to be running full support for these. And so, like, although you're doing an excellent job on creating the wiki, and I think the wiki is fucking phenomenal, like, you're doing a great job with that, dude. I want to give you props for that. But, Thanks. like, in all honesty, I'm thinking about down there, where it's like people are going to be having issues that we can't think of and that we're going to have to do that. And so it's like when they're trying to troubleshoot down there, I want them to be on an operating system that they feel comfortable on. It, Windows is just going to be where it is for everybody, unfortunately. It's a thing. Uh, yeah. So let's take a step so back. So off topic. Yeah, we're oh, off. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So uh, this is this is exactly why I dropped off the conversation when Chris brought up why aren't we just running Windows? Because I have been we have had the same argument for like years. Yeah. And I know now to just I'm just gonna stop. It's not, it's not worth it. I, I think your point is really good though. Uh, like you're running Linux because damn it, you're doing the work. And that is how you're willing to set it up. And if somebody wants to do it different, they're will it that that is up to them. And that is the duocracy. And that is sort of where the duocracy kind of falls apart. 
Because if we had somebody in the space, we actually don't, which I'm shocked about. But if we had somebody in the space that was steadfast against Linux, it would be totally cool for them to take that laptop that you've spent like a whole weekend on, take it home, flash it with Windows 10, load it up with all the 3D printing software and be like, I fixed it. That would that would yeah. be acceptable in our space currently. Yeah. Yes, that would be acceptable. It would be a dick move, though. <laughs> <laughs> Correct. Correct. You know. But yeah, it, to- it totally could happen. I mean, we actually have had something like that happen where, like, somebody put, they did a Linux laptop, and then somebody was like, I did a Windows laptop, too, for everyone who isn't a techie. Um, yeah, we had that happen at one point. And nobody ever used the Windows laptop, shockingly. Well, it was nobody really used any of those laptops because we, we got those and, like, there has been some use of them, but, like... Well, in the old space, we had the the printing laptop set up to the minis. All the minis were plugged into it. Yeah. But we don't have the minis anymore, so we don't... So the, the laptop kind of became a forgotten conclusion, and everybody started slicing on their own laptops, which caused all kinds of new problems. Yeah. Which, which is what <laughs> we're trying to wiki. mitigate right now with Aaron's rendition of the 3D printer computer. Right. And that like it makes sense. Like I I get I get wanting to move to like a single source and like getting all that and doing what you want. It's just I am very much of the thinking of like it needs to be very much future proof. Is that Windows? I don't know. Right now that's what I think it is. But I don't I don't think over time it's going to be that. Well, I can give you this example. My CNC router up until six months ago was running Ubuntu 10.04 with no issues. Yeah. What? Yeah. That was... That is old as shit. That yeah, was that's... Linux CNC version 2.5, and it worked fine. It wasn't on a network. It booted every time I pushed go. go. And literally the only reason it died was the CPU pan packed with MDF dust to the point where it didn't turn anymore and the CPU melted. <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> yeah, that sounds about right. I think, I think we talked about that on the show. Yeah, like, like that is literally the only reason that computer doesn't work anymore. If it still worked, I'd still be running Ubuntu 10.04. Linux is future-proof if you don't touch it. If you let things go, and I know people that have, like, uptime stats of their computers, and they run UPSs just to figure out how long they could run a, a desktop stably with no issues. And it's well, months versus like a Windows PC where you're like, oh man, it's been two weeks. Things are running like shit. <laughs> right. It's it's one of those things where it's like I'm thinking about this in the fact of like there's a possibility that all three of us could not be around in a little like in let's say even five years. I don't this think this podcast true. could kill us. Y- you know, it could. And then we won't close. be at the space anymore. <laughs> <laughs> it's it like <sighs> I'm drinking water now, so this episode won't kill me. Well, here's the thing. You know, after all of that, I I, I dropped off that conversation. And I got a little discouraged because you know I'm sitting here doing all the work and I'm doing what I think is best, and then all these armchair engineers pipe up that are have rarely been in the space. Not calling you out, Chris. There are others. That public, oh, Me? why, 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 why are we doing Linux? Why, why not Windows? Blah, 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 like all, all this crap. And I'm like, okay, well, what do you think we should do different? I don't know. Like, it just became an OS war. And I know, not, I, I know now to get out of that. And I got a little discouraged for a little bit. But then after a couple of days, I'm like, yeah, you know what? I'm doing the work. So I'm just going to keep doing the work. Yep. And, and that's you know, completely fair. Well, and, and it's okay. So here's the other side of not that a different example where something like graphics need to be made for something. And, you know, somebody has got a friend that is a graphic designer and somebody is reasonably okay at being a graphic designer and somebody can sit down and just knock something out real quick and, and get it done. And then we wait on, for weeks on the guy who's got a friend that's a graphic designer. And we wait for a couple of weeks on the somewhat okay graphic designer. And then the guy that could just like sit down and like draw a little bit, like has something and it's there. And we could just use that. And it's probably almost as good if somebody would just give feedback, but we're waiting on these other guys 
But like, we just need to get something done. We need to just do the thing, right? Yeah. This this isn't a scenario that's happened in the makerspace. This is a scenario somewhere else. But um, it's the scenario that I'm currently dealing with, and it's like, do we just do we just do the one that's done? Do we just go with the one that's done instead of waiting on the things that are unknown quantities that are also being done for free or very low cost, which, you know, makes them low priority for the people that we're waiting on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like all of that stuff falls into the duocracy too, because usually the people that are working in that kind of situation aren't getting paid, which puts it at the lowest priority often it depends on if it's a passion project or if it's a hey when do you get time can you do this project the when do you get time projects are always fall at the bottom you know so then you're you're like chasing people down to try to get it done right am i running off on a drunken tangent i can't tell <laughs> i mean it might be relevant it's totally relevant i stopped paying attention good job aaron <laughs> We might we might be getting there, boys. We might we might be starting to scalvage. We're at the fifty-ish minute mark. Time for last call. Do you guys have any final thoughts? We spent like half this episode ranting about Windows versus Linux. I don't even know if we could talk about this as a duocracy episode. This is like the guys bitch about operating systems drunkenly. Oh, this happened again. <laughs> <laughs> the gang goes off topic again uh, <laughs> just listen to through the news and shut it off <laughs> overall, <laughs> overall overall i will i will submit in my thinking of you know what if you're the one doing it you should have the say totally because i'm not doing it you asked for my opinion and i gave it but Overall, you have absolute say in that because you are the one doing it. And that's that's the way that's the way we've built the space and that's the way it should continue to be until it's become an issue. And up to now it hasn't become an issue. Yeah. You make a good point. Aaron asked for an opinion. We gave it. We didn't turn it into an argument until we recorded it and put it on the internet. Um <laughs> but then at the in the end of the day Aaron went ahead and did it the way he wanted to, and it's going to work. Yeah. I, I think at the end of the day, as long as the solution works, who cares? Right. And it's the solution oh, that, it's gonna work. that you're willing to do. It's going to work right. on spite now. It's it, that, that power, yeah. that, that laptop's powered on spite. <laughs> yes, it should be. It's the most performance of the emotions. <laughs> I mean, Fuck. Linux is powered off spite, so it should be powered off spite, but like, yeah, I think as long as the solution works and it's the will, the solution that you're willing to stand behind, that's the solution that you should go with. Yeah. What makes you happy to contribute? That's right. A couple of thoughts that I had that I completely forgot to make. Just real quick. Okay. Let's see. I've seen a couple of people at the space do things that I didn't fully agree with the way they're doing it, but I have learned, you know, over the past year or so, that, you know, I'm not the one doing it, so I might throw my opinion out there. So, like, have you considered doing it a different way? Just to, see, just to get the idea in their head. Because, again, I'm not doing that work. So, I'm happy that they're doing something, so I don't want to, like, discourage them. Yes. That's just something to keep in mind, saying, well... That brings up I disag- something, though. I disagree correct. with you, but I'm also, I also don't want to do it myself. So, you keep doing you. And Do you mind if I bring up my point? Go ahead. Do it. I have other things okay. to remember. I'm just going to I'm going to bring this up real quick and hopefully it doesn't go into a whole tangent. What do you guys think of when people do stuff and you completely disagree with what they're doing and then they try like when you try and encourage them to do it the right way, they complain about it and continue to do it the wrong way. I feel attacked. <laughs> okay. So, I mean, I, I two, are you I, thinking I have two questions. Are, you, okay. are they going to get hurt? And is what they're doing going to put the space or other people in danger? The the thing they are doing is a reflection of the space. Nobody is getting uh, hurt, but what they are doing is a reflection ooh, of the space. Ooh. Is it a legitimate reflection of the space, or is it your opinion that it's a reflection of the space? 
Uh, it's literally a reflection of the space. Like a, a public facing reflection? Yes. I think you guys are getting what I'm finally throwing down. Yeah. If it, if it's going to reflect badly on the space and they won't listen, it should be brought up to somebody else in power. Like if it's going to affect the space or its members in a bad way. I just think if it, anything that's publicly facing should have multiple people. Yes. Discussing over it. Yes. You know, that doesn't necessarily need approvals or anything, but like more than just the one person making a decision, like get m- more than one person. Yeah. Even if it's just two people, I'm fine. But like more more than one. Yeah. Get, get, some, get some other input before you do something that's publicly facing, you know, because we, we all have our own biases and our own blind spots. You know, we might say something or do something that might not be great. Yeah. And it's always better to have at least one of the people, one other person as a safety check. Yeah, no, that's that. That was my old, when you said that. I was like, "Ooh, that reminds me of something that recently <laughs> happened." <laughs> you know, like I, it's. I think it's really important, especially when you're the old guy that's frustrated, to figure out how to delegate tasks in the space and let other people have that that duocracy power, even if they're not going to do it up to your standards. You know, if, if and if it's really important to you that it's done to your standards, you know, let them go and coach them in a supportive manner. Don't be like, Hey, you're an idiot. Stop doing it like this, but be like, yeah, if if we do it this way, this is why this is better. And then maybe they can come back to you and be like, well, I'm doing it this way because of this. And then you'd be like, Oh man, I never thought of it that way. You know, you keep doing what you're doing. I, that's totally happened to me a couple times at the space. I I try to be really, really encouraging of the people that are contributing to the space in meaningful ways. Because yeah. mm-hmm. um, especially as you as we gain new members that are excited about the space, it's important to get them involved in contributing to that community as quickly as possible. So the new shininess doesn't wear off before they're like indoctrinated <laughs> feels culty, <laughs> but you want to get them indoctrinated into helping the space as quick as possible, you know? Yeah. Yeah. While it's still jazzy. Um, I remembered my two other things. Okay. So these are caveats to the duocracy that you must keep in mind. The first thing is some members may have more of a time advantage than others at the space, which would give them more say at the space than someone who is more time constrained, which doesn't, it's not as fair or equal. Mm. Um, not necessarily my case, but the second one is more of a try hard based advantage where you have people who care so much about the space that they just, it's much more prioritized over others. And I would put myself in that category because I just care so much about the space that like right below family is the maker space. And like that is above my own personal projects and my all my other hobbies. And that's that's why I'm so adamant on the things that I do with the space is because I care so much. If you get people like me in your space, they become annoying and yeah, they do. Very stubborn and, you know, and then, but, and and they become and, a force to be reckoned with and you have to take care of those people in the best like, way. Yeah. They can easily take over the space like I have. <laughs> <laughs> Snicked my way in there. <laughs> those are the, those those are the things that you need to you know be careful of with the duocracy. Yeah, I think the biggest thing you need to t- to be careful of is like we've run into a couple situations where the duocracy was like, well, just fucking do it unless you're this person, and then maybe we need to keep an eye on them while they're doing it. Yeah, it, it, that's the biggest problem with the duocracy and the JFDI mentality that a lot of makerspaces have is like some people shouldn't be trusted to just JFDI because it's either dangerous for them or um, they're it causes damage to the building and the landlord gets upset. Yeah. <laughs> There's that. Yeah. Um, you know, maybe instructions weren't communicated properly to that person like it. There's a whole bunch of things. So you kind of have to be careful with that mentality. It gets a lot of things done, but it can get you into trouble at the same time. It, that's that's a hard thing to deal with. Ah, oh, this is an exhausting podcast. Uh, I, I I don't know why, but maybe cut all of this section out and put it in front of the ranty OS bits. 
I know. These are all the points I wanted to make earlier. Yeah. All right. So let's do <laughs> that. <laughs> I don't want to do all that. Nah, just just little as possible, dude. Don't don't put yourself out for it. <laughs> It'll be fine. Ah, gosh. All right. You want to end it? Yes. Let's do it. Hey, thanks everybody for tuning in. Um, it's been a it's been an episode. Episode uh, if you fifty four fifty freaking four. Uh, if you haven't already, please follow us on social. Find us on all of the good stuff. We're pretty active on Twitter. We also have a Reddit community. Uh, we have a donate button on our yes. uh, website. Um, so if you want to help support the podcast in any way, um, please feel free to contribute to the podcast. It helps us basically produce. That's all we're using any contributions for right now is to help produce the podcast to be better for you to be able to listen. So again, thank you so much for tuning in and listening to us rant um, about everything. Um, It was, it was an experience. We haven't had one of these in a while. So um, (laughs) have a good night, everybody. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And we will see you next week. <laughs> to the actual end of the podcast. <laughs> Keep making stuff. And stuff. And stuff. And stuff. And stuff.